Very convenient. So I will say good morning to everybody in the room, in the United States, and around the world. <laughs> and by around the world, I mean my mum and dad, who love to watch a good Charles and Collegiate video that gets posted to wonder exactly what I do every day. Um, so welcome. Uh, we have a smorgasbord uh, this morning for you about the middle school program. So the way that this fits into kind of our, I guess, our communication uh, strategy regarding curriculum and programming um, is around this time of year we like to do transition meetings, program meetings so that parents, guardians can just really understand um, what lies ahead. And so on Tuesday uh, we did our upper school meetings uh, which, were, which were wonderful. Same routine, Tuesday morning 8.15 till 9.15 and then we did an afternoon one. That one will be recorded, edited and shared with the parent community. So we did a similar meeting last year and when we were virtual you may remember that Yvonne and I, Ms. Barheit and I, um, hosted uh, some virtual meetings about programming, uh, particularly at that point, you know, version one, two, three, four, six of virtual learners, we adapted that. Um, and then back in August, we shared a video which was all about the program for this year. Uh, so this is something that we love to do, it's something that we like to do regularly, uh, because the program does change and it does evolve. Um, in addition to Yvonne and I speaking this morning, uh, we've got Ms. Lucky and Ms. Spikes going to speak today middle school teachers, uh, we have a couple of students who are going to speak as well, so Zoe and, and Addie at the back, and then uh, Miss Boyd, our curriculum guru, uh, Dean of Curriculum will be speaking. So, um, we want to talk a little bit, the, the, the focus for today of course is, is middle school, I am going to talk about high school towards the end, because it's impossible to speak about middle school without speaking about what lies ahead. So we'll touch on that at the end, and of course if you want to, add, to get any more information about high school, you can watch the video that's going to be that's going to be shared in due course. Uh, the focus of middle school, of course, is to grow our students. And what we mean by that is grow their skills, their capabilities, their confidence, their core skills, um, their core values, their success skills, their advocacy, community, etc. And so the program is built around the notion of growth. When we get into high school, we start to focus on, on the leadership element. So moving, moving from that growth model into how are you going to lead? How are you going to lead at work, in your internship, in your majors experience? Uh, when you're off campus and eventually when you go to college. Uh, and lots of fun information coming out about uh, where our students are off to, some very aspirational things. Um, and so that's the focus in middle school. To start with, um, we wanted to kind of touch on, or go into some depth I guess, on uh, the PBL curriculum at Charleston College. So I think everybody has a varying degree of knowledge and understanding about what we mean when we talk about project-based learning. So does that mean that my son or daughter is doing some projects in class? It does. Um, and so regardless of what school you go to, your child will produce projects in some form or another. But they're typically a bit more superficial and surface. And that's not a, a comment or a condemnation of uh, other people's curriculum models, but just we go for, for a, a, a much deeper project-based or problem-based curriculum. So we put together this slide. I cracked the same joke on Tuesday. I feel like I should give you guys the same thing. You know, I'm very, very pleased with this slide. It took me ages to colours right and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we think this is kind of a one-stop shop for what are the key differences between a deep and enriching project-based uh, curriculum versus a traditional curriculum. Uh, and when I recount many of my own school days, um, I think about how passive chunks of that experience were. Um, we didn't necessarily understand or know why we were learning what we were learning. Just the teacher told us today we're doing this. And I knew that chapter 6 followed chapter 5, but they didn't necessarily uh, build towards something under a larger umbrella concept or towards a larger uh, project that we were going to present. You just kind of did the day-to-day -day teaching and learning. Uh, teacher as instructor, teacher of giver of all knowledge, you as recipient. Um, and so just a very one-way process. And it was passive. Uh, for some classes that I did at high school, you could largely sit there and, and be pedestrian. You know, and if you took notes and glanced at the teacher every now and again, you were being compliant and you were doing what you needed to do. And you take the exam at the end, and, and that was the end of it. It wasn't particularly rich or enjoyable, but it's just something that you had to do, par for the course. So traditional curriculum is significantly more passive, um, and I'm just going to pick a couple of these out because I know that Liz is going to come up and talk a little bit more about, about projects in a second. I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, I think it was all about, for me, a traditional curriculum is much more linear. And so, um, even if I think about the last school that I came from, which was an, an outstanding institution, an IB World School, uh, the Baton Rouge International School, terrific school, but the program was still significantly linear in its approach. 
So you studied two-year courses uh, in 11th and 12th grade, and then you took these massive exams at the end. So it was more about, you know, it was still about rote learning. It was still about memorization. It was still about what can you remember on the day of the exam. Now, IB exams are critical thinking exams. And so it does ask you to do things that are intellectually rigorous. But it's still about storing up all of this stuff for two years and then taking two, three-hour papers. Well, what if you're sick on the day of the exam? You know? Uh, and so we don't think that that's the way to go. We think that a, cr a cross-curricular model rather than a linear model interdisciplinary subjects makes much more sense. And we believe that that replicates the real world much more significantly. Um, the final one I want to pick up on before uh, Liz comes up is um, the notion of things being content-driven and skills-driven. Um, and so sometimes I think there's a, a danger that parents might think, well, the school is doing so much with skills, are, are the students still you know, covering the content? Well, our kids still do, you know, if I take high school as an example, I'll come back to middle school, but for high school credits, which parents are often concerned with, they still do Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, Pre-Cal and Cal. They still do Biology, Chemistry, Physics, Environmental Science and Forensics. So they're still covering those same subjects, it's just how we choose to cover them. You know, in middle school, um, humanities is integrated. Um, there's projects going on that go across STEM, math and science together. Um, there'll be, for example, in eighth grade, which again, I know that Jenny will speak about, financial literacy paired with humanities. And so there's a lot of cross-curricular stuff going on. And so how we approach this is significantly different. The world is shifting, uh, and it's a curve that you, it's, it's a curve that you want to be on the, the forefront of, not behind. Um, if your brain is a rather simpler uh, machine like mine, then you like, you like diagrams. Um, and so at this point, I'm going to welcome Liz. Uh, Liz Boyd's going to come up, and she's going to talk in a bit more uh, depth about the science behind project-based learning, and then we'll, we'll talk about some actual examples of units that we do at school, which are projects. Right. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, John. So, I want to talk for a minute about the landscape of the work world, right? It looks very different today than it did 20 years ago. But in another 20 years, it's going to look even more different for our children. So, we have to prepare them for that future workplace in a very different way than we were prepared. It worked for us, right, when we looked at that traditional curriculum and that traditional way that we were taught. I think I'll even go to the next slide and you'll see this worked really well. We memorized a lot. We did what we were told. And we were prepared. But the landscape is changing for our children. So we're going to have to prepare them differently. What does that mean? So think about when they will be given a problem to solve. They're going to have to be innovative and recreate a product that's already out there. Because it might not be selling anymore. So they're going to have to do something new and different to reach a new audience. Well, they're going to have to change from the way we used to prepare students. We're going to have to give them new tools. We're going to have to prepare them for that kind of environment where they're going to have to use a team approach. They're going to have to problem solve. You're going to have to use project management. You're going to have to try things and fail and be okay with that. And they're going to have to get feedback from each other and figure out new ways to solve things. So that's the future that they're going to encounter. And we have to look a little different in our schooling so we can prepare them for that. So how do we do that? We do that through this student-centered model. And I'll go back to this diagram to show you. So the student-centered model is what project-based learning is all about. So projects put the student in the center of discovering the learning. When we put projects in front of them, it might sound like something you may have heard your children do before, maybe. You know, um, they're going to study a concept, and then we're going to do a project. That makes project-based learning sound the same as projects? Not really. Projects as the after effect are kind of what people talk, call as the dessert project, right? You study the concept, you do a project. But what project-based learning is, what we're trying to accomplish here, is putting the students at the center of discovering and learning. The project is the main course. Through the project, they're discovering all the information. So, 
If you think of places that say they're doing projects, we're making sure that we're doing them well. We're making sure that our projects are well-rounded and have all the elements that they need. In non-COVID years, they're going to include connecting to the outside of school world. They're going to be connecting to businesses in the community, guest speakers. They're going to make sure that they are driven by essential questions that frame the learning process. And these essential questions just breed more and more questions and they're never closed closed questions. They're always open-ended, so then students just keep discovering. When you have a great essential question driving a project, you're never going to have one same answer for every child. They're all going to come at it differently, which is part of what makes project-based learning so great, is that there are so many ways that you can have student choice, so many ways that students can enter into these projects. So that's one thing we value tremendously at Charleston Collegiate is making sure that they have their voice, they have their choice, they have creativity that comes in all different forms. Students can choose maybe to use Photoshop as a way to present or that they can use graphic design, they can use something else um, creative, they can make a stop motion film to present their work, they can do a, you know, a regular commercial to pre present their work. So we give them lots of choices. So when I say present their work, that's another element of project-based learning that we really value. It's called exhibition. So the exhibition of learning is presentation of learning. So again, think of a student really knowing their subject area because they've uh, been so invested in this project. They know it so well, but now it's time to present it to the public. There's nowhere to hide on exhibition day when you're presenting your learning. You have to know your stuff really well because you're going to have to stand up in front of a group Present your learning, which is public speaking, being confident. We teach them how to do all of those things, and we start small, and we get bigger and bigger and bigger. But imagine down the road when they're in the work world, and they're having to present that same project to their employer, and now look at their great public speaking experience that they have already been working on since they were young, when they're very well prepared. And I'll tell you a story the other day. During the high school presentation, we had one of our seniors um, giving her, you know, I guess, assessment of what life was like at Charleston Collegiate in high school. And it was so nice to hear that she's in her internship at MUSC, and her internship employer says, oh my gosh, your public speaking is so much better than almost everyone who I work with who are adults. And she's like, well, oh, that's Charleston Collegiate for you. Um, and she just laughed at you know, how much she has practiced that over the years. So that's project-based learning in an you know, overview, in a big picture. You know, as we get um, here from Avant Barheit on the kind of as you bring it down, what does it look like in the classroom? How do we do this, right? How does this student-centered world actually happen? So I'll pass it off to you, Avant. Okay. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm not going to get into the project yet. I'm going to talk about what they actually, the curriculum. We do have a curriculum that is research-based and really rigorous and rich. And then the exhibition of the learning and the, uh, the doing is through the project. So we're hold on to what Liz talked about as I explained. And I could talk about this for days. I promise <laughs> not to. I can get carried away. I'm kind of a curriculum geek. Um, but let me just give you the overview um, about it. We do teach in humanities and STEM, and the humanities is a combination of really rich language arts. It's vocabulary, a deep study of vocabulary, reading, writing, grammar, everything that you know about typical in an English language arts content mixed with social studies and um, and so that and then in middle school we cover world history, American history, civics, current events, geography the typical things, but they are cross-curricular combined. So when uh, you are learning how to read one of the content um, units that they study is historical fiction. So you're going to read historical fiction and understand how to, and there's book clubs to discuss it, but it may be around the time period that you're also studying in um, American history or in world history. Another thing that we would do is if you're, um, you learn how to do deep, real research, that's through language arts, you learn how what, what are primary sources, what, what to how to read primary sources, how to find them, what, how to actually read really difficult, non-complex non-fiction, how to understand it, what to, how to take notes. I mean, it's complex. 
But then when they go to read anything in social studies or science, they read like a historian or read like a mathematician or read like a scientist. So that's the goal. And it's all cross-curricular. And again, I could go on and on, but I won't bore you with that. In STEM, we worked really hard and same in, um, we have, I just want to step back and say, the low, uh, we have really made our curriculum aligned from pre-K all the way to 12. Um, we use various, our curriculum in online charts is aligned and it just gets more and more progressively challenging as they get older. And the same in math. We have bridges in lower school that goes through fifth grade and then goes to, and they use Alex both in um, both lower school and middle school. And also, and then it goes illustrative math, which is problem based. And uh, it's very much like how we, we want the kids to be thinking, but they're ready by then to really take a problem and dig into it and, and solve it and experiment around it and figure out that's not right, use what they know. It's, uh, it's challenging for the kids. We call it for, uh, productive struggle, which is important for them to figure out. Um, and that's hard sometimes for a 12 year old, but they're learning, they're learning well. So um, that's that. In science, I don't want to read all that to you, but we cover all the, the major science areas. And again, that is um, through when we use product projects to kind of exhibit their information that they've learned. Our special areas are one of the things that I feel is makes us the gem of a school. We have rich special areas. Um, we, you, know, you know about our pillars, our outdoor education program is amazing. And through the outdoor education program, students really get opportunities to be not only stewards of the environment, but they're learning leadership skills and they're learning the core values in action. And it is, uh, we have some extraordinary and talented teachers um, with Brocaney leading that. Our music, they do cultural context, their music research, their songwriting, and so they have um, music in middle school. We also have the arts. Uh, Austin Wyckoff is extraordinarily talented. She gives them a wide variety of years. Um, animation, craftsmanship, photography, filmmaking. When you're 11 and 12, I mean, it's amazing. I never got any of those things, so I just, and the products they come out with, I'm ready to buy some. I saw a seventh grade exhibition of their photography, and I was ready to buy a couple of pieces. They were remarkable. Like, you just would never have guessed it. So, and to have that seventh grader stand up there and explain their process and some of their failures and what made them change it when they realized it wasn't just right. It just makes your heart like so proud. It was remarkable. Another part of our gems of financial literacy, which I don't want to steal their thunder, we're going to talk about a little bit later. That's under we try to include that in most of our um, as many projects that it's appropriate. And entrepreneurship, they are actually explicit teaching on that. And then of course the regulars. We have STEM, which is all project based and very student centered and very cross curricular. One of the things that um, uh, Ms. Casaccio prides herself on is she meets with the teachers a lot so she can make sure that she is able to provide a, 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 something that's appropriate, something that ma matches or coordinates with whatever they're learning in science and math and social studies and science. There's Spanish, there's typing, which I've got to tell you that's an important skill. You know, they use these iPads, but they don't really know how to type. And now they're realizing they're taking this typing class. That it's getting so much better. I'm getting so much faster. We start that with fifth and sixth character education. And we also have an extraordinary student support teacher who helps students who just need a little more um, support in whatever their, their um, area is. So that's the overview. And again, if you have any questions about specifics, I'm more than happy to talk to you about, oh, God, what I do. All right, somebody help me here. <laughs> there we go. Okay, this is the other thing about our uh, program. We don't just stop at the curriculum and the content. And I can begin this. I can talk for days about this. This is what makes our, our program really, really unique. We do have a rigorous PBL, which you're going to hear about. We do have a student-centered learner approach. We have oaks and acorns. I don't know if you guys are familiar with oaks and acorns. This year it's been COVIDized and we aren't, it's not quite the same, but in, in a normal time, 
the older students middle school and up, they are the oak, and the little ones in lower school are the acorns, and we match them up and they have activities once a month. And it is the children's favorite time. And my favorite thing is when you're walking through campus and they see their oak, they just, it's like they saw a movie star. They just go crazy. They're so excited to have this relationship with this older student. It's pretty cool. I think there's oaks and acorns today. Yes. Yeah. And we have um, the RISE curriculum, and um, that's a, an amazing program where we, it, RISE, which stands for Respect, Include, Support, and Educate. Thanks. <laughs> Along the way, we teach success skills. And I actually have seen in one of my um, success skills classes. I teach one on creativity and innovation. And um, what's where we just take a deep dive into when we select different success skills. And this year, we're doing creativity and management, data management. And um, we just take a deep dive into what is that? What does that look like? What does it sound like? Who, how do you do it? They have guest speakers. They we do projects. It's been. Um, Really, really fun for me. Out of my comfort zone, teaching seventh and eighth grade, but I gotta tell you, I've actually really loved it. It's a secret. Um, I'm gonna let the middle school teachers talk about the whole child focus because they have they're the ones that actually do the work where we have dedicated advisory time and so on. You wanna come up and talk about that before we meet Zoe? Sure. Yeah. Because that's the the magic. And then you can that one. <laughs> um, I guess to start off with the whole child focus, um, fifth grade, even though traditionally in some schools it's still elementary school, it's middle school here at CCS. So a lot of, especially the first semester of fifth grade, we use project time to get the kids ready for middle school. How to read emails, how not to write your entire content in the subject line, um, how to ask your teacher for help politely. So we go through you know, how to be an advocate for yourself, um, kind of coming back to those core values. That's a big, a big transition from lower school, getting the kids to be accountable for their learning and at the same time to advocate for themselves too. So that middle school 101 really is fifth grade of how do you CCS connect? how to talk to a teacher, you know, so it's getting them comfortable in that setting. Um, yeah, and I'll piggyback on that too. For seventh and eighth grade, I, I mean, the same core values are gonna carry up into seventh and eighth grade. I think really it's about um, teamwork, um, how to collaborate with peers, um, how to communicate with teachers as well. Even something as simple as I'm learning virtually and I have to send an email to my teacher. How am I gonna format that email? So. But really, I think the biggest, um, the biggest core value for these children in 7th and 8th grade with the project-based learning is really just communicating with one, with one another, excuse me. And I think also with the cross-curricular in terms of we're a small enough school, so we do a lot of team planning. Um, this year it's looked different because of COVID, so we can't have big groups of kids together. Um, but a lot of times and you two in the back can attest for this, mm -hmm. they'll be like the week of exhibition and they're seeing all their teachers at one time and if they need help for this part of the project, they're with that teacher. You know, we're able to change the schedule around when we need to for the kids and that's something that's very unique to our school. We're not, you only see this child for two hours and that's it. So that's definitely something that makes us very unique. Yeah, and then when you look at uh, dedicated advisory time, I think that's a great time also for the individual advisor to sit down with the individual advisee and just discuss, uh, to look at grades, for example. Um, and then one thing we also do is, um, what, once a quarter we meet with parents and teachers, but it's really the student who's leading the conference as well when we do have parent-teacher conferences. Um, so it's another thing, I guess that goes back to the core values and the communication with the student actually leading the conference and knowing how to carry themselves in a conference and speaking to parents and the teachers at the same time. So. Great, thanks you guys. No worries. Sure. sure. Yeah. I'll leave this the next slide. Zoe Vanderbilt, come on down. <laughs> and Addie too. Zoe and Addie are current seventh graders. Which one? Where am I directing it to? <laughs> okay. I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, hi, I'm Zoe. I'm in seventh grade. I've been here since first grade, so about seven years. Um, I am part of the JV volleyball, varsity basketball, and varsity soccer team. Uh, when I transitioned to seventh grade from sixth grade, I definitely found it more challenging, but I loved that it was more challenging because then I got to learn more from it. 
And just something I love about CCS is like the hands-on activities and how we're always working in groups and like the project-based learning. And for example, we did an American Revolution infographic and I love that we got to pull in graphic design into that project. And something that I just loved about CCS is that it feels like a great community and it feels like such a good family environment. Good morning, I'm Addie Olson. I've been here since preschool, so for about 10 years. I'm also in seventh grade. And one of my favorite things about CCS is definitely the outdoor activities that we do because we have to pull in the OEC elements to do so. And I also agree with Zoe, it was pretty hard moving up to seventh and eighth grade, but I like to challenge myself, so it was it turned out to be fun. And one of my most interesting projects that I've done this year is definitely the I Need a Larger Recipe, which is where we took a proportion of an original um, original recipe and we made it large enough for a whole class and then we got to bake. And I'm a person who likes to make things, like in Miss Maggie's interior design class. And I love to bake, so this was probably one of my favorite projects we've done. And my favorite thing about CCS overall is definitely the lasting friendships because I've been here since pre-K, like I said, and my relationships from 10 years ago are still as strong as they are today. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Addy, thank you, Zoe. Ladies, I'm going to throw a quick question at you. Which I, 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 you don't know this is coming, so we're just going off script a little bit here. But um, Addy, you mentioned interior design there. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about the middle school majors program? Because we haven't spoken about that just yet. You guys can talk about stuff you did in semester one, semester two, the choices you made, and the kind of stuff that you do. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, on Wednesdays, we do something called middle school majors. And so from about one to three, we have two majors that we choose. And for example, in the first semester, I did um, art, well, wait, sorry. I did um, interpretive art. And then for my second major, I did physics. And I just thought it was really cool. And I got to learn all, um, a lot of stuff in those categories. For my majors this year, I, for the first semester, I chose The World Is Your Stage because I love theater. And my second major was Bridge Bake Off because it was about baking. And this semester, I am doing interior design and art club. But another thing that Zoe and I really like about CCS is doing sports together because we actually are able to play up on the varsity team together this year. And um, we also did some plays in lower school together which was definitely really fun. Cool. Great. Thank, Thank you, ladies. ladies. That's awesome. So now we're going to ask the teachers. Oh, sorry. Did you... No, that's um, that's Chelsea and Jenny are coming back. Yeah, Chelsea and Jenny are coming back. Yeah, right. Do you want to talk about yeah, this specific project? Sure. Yeah, um, you guys have a run now. You've got three or four. I have a cheat sheet for science. So. All right. <laughs> we do a lot of projects in middle school. Yeah. These are just a sample of a yeah. few that we've done over the past couple of years. Um, probably one of my favorites that I have ever done um, was about two years, three years ago, I'm sorry, the fifth grade folktale festival. And essentially, in humanities class, it started out where we were learning about African culture in West Africa and the importance of griots in the community. And then we were also reading mythology. And you know, a lot of times with reading workshop, we start out as the readers, and then we become the authors. And the kids started to write their own creation stories about um, how different African landforms or animals or biomes came to existence. Mr. Fisher, at the same time, was teaching his kids about light and shadows and sound. And he, me and him were just talking one day, and he's like, wouldn't it be really cool if we put on a puppet show? And I was like, ooh, yes, that would be really cool. So the kids then, we got an author actually to come in. Um, we did, a, this was before COVID, before we all knew what Zoom was on a regular basis. <laughs> Zoomed in, and I thought we were very fancy. Um, Zoomed in with us, gave the kids some pointers. The kids then turned their, um, they vote, this is kind of where the success skills came in. They shared their myths with each other. And through their sharing and knowing about design and shadows from Mr. Fisher, they decided on about five or six stories that they could turn into plays. Then they were put into teams, and that cooperation and collaboration came about. 
Um, even though it was one student's original story, it became a production for that whole group. Um, and they wrote scripts, and then we put on a puppet show, and it was so cool. Um, we ended up getting a guest speaker who was a professional puppeteer came in to give them some pointers. Um, but it ended up being from the beginning to the end, like it was just the kids loved it. It was very exciting. And, you know, we started off with all that academic foundation, but really the success skills are what drove that home, like what made that production so amazing. Um, another project in uh, sixth grade one year that they did was they were learning about ancient history. Um, I believe the ancient Romans with the aqueducts. And then they were studying um, astrology. And they ended up coming up with this essential question about water and how they used water in the past and how in the present, how water can be hard for some countries to actually have. And then in the future, how can we get water in outer space? So the kids went through this this very long journey in terms of looking at water usage and the importance of it, sustainable water, and they created models of past aqueducts and then future ones for outer space. So that was a really cool, um, I didn't teach that one, but it was a cool journey to watch. Awesome. Okay, so I was talking about the seventh and eighth grade projects. One of the projects that Ms. Olson and I did this year was actually called the Create a Creature Project. So this is my um, where I'm going to cheat because I am not a scientist person. But um, so this is part of her classification of living things unit. And so what were what they did was create and sketch a creature. So they literally created a creature out of their own minds. One of the examples was something called a donut cat. Um, and what they had to do was give it a scientific name based on traits, and then they photoshopped the creature um, and placed it in its chosen environment. And then they discussed the adaptations of the, um, of the creature and how it was going to survive, a food web. And then my portion for humanities was we actually focused on writing short stories, and we read certain short stories, so they applied the elements of a short story. And they took this species and then um, created a short story based on the origin of the actual species. And so there were a lot of crazy um, lab experiments that kind of went awry in their stories. But it, they then um, read the short stories aloud to the entire class and then they created these creatures out of recycled material, correct? And then they presented their creatures as well at the same time. So it was fun to see and fun to watch. Um, and then Addie already talked about a need a larger recipe, which was a math project. And then another um, math project was the Pysanki egg, mm -hmm. um, which is a Ukrainian Easter egg. And what Ms. Matthews did was she took the egg, or sorry, took a, um, a graph, if you will, and then the kids were studying transformations and reflections. And so they created their own line. So this, once again, brings in choice. And then from that, they put it on the actual egg, and you can see the different designs. So Ms. Matthews has tons of these eggs still in her closet, but if, I don't know if you guys want to pass around, you can see the different coordinates. But the biggest project, I think, and the culminating project of the entire middle school is the eighth grade exhibition, which up here is called Careers, Colleges, and Choices. And um, once again, bringing in choice. But this is the students really immersing themselves in experiential learning. Um, they choose a career. They research this career. They then look at colleges where they could possibly get those degrees to then be, um, get that career, excuse me. And they do job shadows for the day, um, sometimes for a week. We've had, my son actually did it when he was in the eighth grade, and he did a job shadow at the harbor pilot, so he was able to go out there on a pilot boat and watch the pilots climb from the little, climb onto the rope ladder up to the big cargo ship. But then they come back and they present their findings to parents, um, to, you know, an audience of parents, students, and teachers. And um, it's just, it's a huge experience for them, but it also brings in, I do need to talk about the personal finance aspect, mm -hmm. because Leticia, or Ms. Sowers um, teaches them throughout the entire year personal finance. And so how they apply it to this project is just researching the cost of a college. And so the students literally look at the college, they look at meal plans, they look at um, transportation, for example, 
the cost of books, what they're going to need for this college. And it's kind of a light bulb, I think, that goes up because they finally realize, It's oh interesting my gosh. watching them present that. Yes. And they're like, and then I learned how much, like, <laughs> how much a cell phone bill is. Right. So they, um, they look at scholarship opportunities as well. But it's a great way for them to just become interested in life after school and what that is going to look like. And we've had some students who... They complete their eighth grade exhibition, and then when they get to majors, when they're juniors and seniors, they follow that same career path, and it's just interesting to see. But some kids also in eighth grade, when they're researching this career, they realize, ooh, this is definitely not what I want to do. But that's also, it's a good learning experience, and they can present those findings in their actual presentation. So, but it's... Um, I love the project. I think the kids are terrified of it when they begin middle school, but then when they actually get there, they realize this isn't that bad. It's a sense of accomplishment. So it is. Yeah. So they do a fantastic job. But oh. and to kind of going with all of the projects, um, one of the big things, especially when we finish the project, it's not like oh, project's done. Monday we start something new. Usually, the next week afterwards is a time of conferencing. Um, and this isn't even just for big projects. A lot of times, you know, in fifth grade, like I'm conferencing with a group today. It's kind of about reflecting on what you've learned and why you need it. Um, but it is fun after the big projects when they rank themselves on the success skills. And they have these big realizations of like, I shouldn't procrastinate. And then they explain to me why. And I'm like, okay, we're going to remember this for the next one. You know, um, and it's just fun to watch them, you know, grow through those reflections over the course of the year because, again, as Mr. Cook mentioned earlier, you know, it's not just you memorize something and you move on for a test. These are life skills we're teaching them and we want them to be able to apply them to their big exhibition in eighth grade. And then when they're in high school to their big majors program or when they go public speak at MUSC, you know, we want them to remember these skills. Um, the same thing for peer feedback. A lot of the projects that we have mentioned um, the kids will complete the project, they'll present the project if they need to, but then they sit down with their group and they discuss the pro what everyone did. Like, what was your participation? Um, if I could grade you, what would I give you? But then they talk about it, and mm -hmm. then that has to do with the KISH feedback that Chelsea's going to talk about, but they just need to make sure it's not, oh, you didn't do well at this, but how can we improve? How can we do better next time? And, and with the KISH feedback, um, KISH stands for Kind, Informative, Specific, and Helpful Feedback. So a lot of times when the kids come in at fifth grade, they want to give each other feedback, but they don't know how to do it very nicely. <laughs> or they don't know how to do it so it's specific and helpful. Um, so we spend a lot of time practicing that skill. Um, sometimes we'll say, you know, you're not looking for, you know, no, no one's a grammar expert in this class, so we're not looking for that. We're looking for content, you know. So it's coaching them to how to critique other people's work and how to critique themselves. And then lastly, we have conscious discipline. I think conscious discipline in middle school looks a lot different than it does in lower school. Um, for example, I think this year especially with COVID, um, it's great if a, if a child maybe after 30 minutes just needs a little bit of a breather and so they can go outside and they can take a mask break and then they come right back in. Um, but really within the classroom, I think Mr. Haney does a great job with conscious discipline and really putting it on the students. Um, he does something where the class during OEC has something called a full value contract. And so it's not the teacher telling the student, this is your behavior, this is what we need to look for. But the class, for example, the seventh grade is doing this right now, the class actually writes a contract together and this is what we need to look for. And every morning they have this class, they go through the contract and they read through the different um, the values of the contract and give a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or kind of a sideways. So do you all want to share what some of those values are that you have for this year? So one of the things that we did was using props effectively. And props means people respecting other people speaking. And basically, when somebody's kind of feeling like they need to talk to the group, they can either say circle or props, because some people might not be listening, but then they know. They shouldn't be listening when they say that. So um, two others are um, be responsible for your actions, so you should really always be responsible and come ready and like, prepare to class. And then the third one is focusing on the task at hand because and Addie can use like prompts like she said to like get everyone focused and ready to go for the game and everything. So it really 
teaches kids accountability mm -hmm. and using their voice right. because that's the other thing. My kids had OEC with Mr. Haney the first quarter. We're now in the third and they will remind each other props if somebody is small, you know, speaking in a small group or if an adult is trying to talk, they'll say that to one another instead of the adult having to address it. It's pretty, it's powerful. Yeah, and it's great seeing the transition from fifth grade up mm -hmm. to seventh grade and how these core values are still carrying out in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so going more on to middle school life, um, unfortunately this year, because of COVID, <laughs> we did not get to do um, the overnight trips that we love. Um, but that is a big part of CCS Middle School. Um, last year, we did uh, overnight in, on campus. Um, the kids got to do the flying squirrel in the OEC. It was, it's great because we always do it at the beginning of the year. And even though I know the majority, especially of the lower schoolers, because, I, you know, it's small school, you really get to know the kids early on outside of the classroom. And, and they it, get to know each other. Yeah, well. like it's a, so, it's a good bonding yes. experience. Um, some of the other overnight trips that we did, we went to, we've gone to Camp Greenville, we've gone to Washington, D.C. These are fantastic trips. We did Space Camp one year. Um, last year, the 8th grade actually did a camp out at James Island County Park and they did the Rhodes course. So it's a lot of fun, a lot of team building activities and com continuing with these mm -hmm. core value skills. Uh, we do advisory competitions. Um, the Scarecrow in fifth and sixth grade is pretty cutthroat, not going to lie. Um, there is there are some teacher egos that are heavily involved in that, and I'm included. Um, but it is a lot of fun. The kids get very into it. Do you guys remember your Scarecrows from fifth and sixth grade? Yeah, the yep. door decorator, Miss Matthews, always wins. So yes. we all just kind of draw yeah, teachers, on teachers do advisory competitions just as much as uh, yes. the kids do. Yeah. Um, you know, we also still do Spirit Week, um, dress down days, and you know, celebrations of our sports teams um, throughout the year. And blue gold competitions that could be well, like field day at the very end of the year. But then also throughout individual classes, we'll have competitions if we have a spelling bee, for example, or a geography bee. Who has their badge today? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> right. Something as simple as that will establish uh, blue gold points for those teams. Um, and then middle school dances, of course, it's a little sad this year because of COVID. We keep saying that, yeah. but eventually they will come back. So we've had Valentine's dances the past couple of years, and then which has been put on by the eighth grade too. Yes, and the fifth and sixth grade does a dance on Friday night, mm -hmm. I believe. Yes, mm -hmm. and so parents help with that on as well. So that's cute. It's fun. It's always fun. It is. So. Um, and then there are a lot of athletic athletic opportunities in middle school. Um, so, as you can see, there are, there are many to choose from. Um, my child right now is in fourth grade, and he is very much looking forward to next year and being able to be a part of a team. Um, he's actually been working with Coach Brown since he was, like, little in first grade, doing clinics, and now he's so excited that next year he can be on the basketball team. So it's that whole going back to the very beginning, the growing in lower school to... To middle school. And I think yeah. the first year we had a soccer team in the middle school, there were maybe... 15 kids who signed up, and now there are two teams of, what, how many are on the middle school team? And they're mostly girls. And they're mostly girls, yeah. And then the two back here um, are playing varsity soccer this year, and Zoe's the actual goalie, which is pretty... And it's also, we have archery, which has grown in the past couple of years, where... It go, we had a bunch of fifth graders just won some very large trophies last week, actually. Um, they were very, very proud of themselves. Right, so now we have two archery teams as yeah. well. One is middle school and then one is high school. And even so. the tennis team this year has, what, 31 kids mm -hmm. on it? Yeah. So our, our sports program is definitely flourishing. And I think it's, again, allowed, like the amount of programs that we have. It's really awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, ladies. Thank you okay. very much. Good job. All right. Everyone. You'll be pleased to know it's almost the end. There's, there's, there's only another uh, 30 or 40 slides to go on. Um, I do want to touch on um, some of the things that Jenny and Chelsea mentioned. They talked about uh, you know, middle school majors, and Jenny mentioned about her son uh, getting to be a harbour pilot for the day. Well, he's now uh, a junior, and he now goes out on a Wednesday afternoon and does an internship every Wednesday. So uh, in terms of, we've talked about how it kind of builds from lower school into middle school. And so I just want to touch on the trajectory into high school, because these things are obviously deeply connected, deeply rooted. This is the, this is the boring part, this is just the, uh, the credits that the kids do. Uh, like I said, the magic is how these credits are delivered. So I want to pick a couple of things off of there. I want to talk about uh, senior majors, junior majors, 
Uh, so we start in fifth grade with the, with the middle school majors program, uh, which is built around the 16 career clusters. So we're trying to give our students an exposure to different careers, different vocations, and we do that through um, you know, junior master chef, British Bake Off, think like a physicist, interior design, clay jewelry making businesses, uh, special effects makeup, yoga, um, things I wish I'd known, which is effectively like a philosophy class. Um, and so the students think it's wonderful because they get to pick. They get to pick two in semester one and two in semester two. Uh, they think it's loads of fun, which it is, but what they don't realize is we're just kind of exposing them to different careers. So we do that from fifth grade all the way through 10th grade. So they get to, to explore those things. And of course that couples with um, what Jenny mentioned about the work experience and the college research that they're doing in eighth grade. So he says there's a big emphasis on careers and life after school. When they get to 11th grade, they go out on their junior majors. So every Wednesday afternoon, they go out and they go to work. On a Wednesday, our seniors go out to work for the day. So our seniors do not come to school. On a Wednesday, uh, they get up, they put on a shirt and a tie or a medical uniform if you're Alec and you're working at, um, working at MUSC. Or you put on your you know, sports clothes to go be a physical therapist and you go to work. So our, our seniors go to work on a Wednesday, they come to school on the other day, which is very, very cool. Um, so that's the trajectory of what we start in, in middle school and how that ends up and what that looks like. In terms of the college part of that, of course, when they come to write their college application letters and we're writing their references, they've done community service every year in high school. They've been through this rigorous PBL curriculum. They've got legitimate work experience and internships. They've often got references um, from their, from their, from their uh, internship manager. Um, and so when they come to write their letter of recommendation for them, for us to write that for them, it's easy to write because they, they, they've got a really rich experience. Um, one of our seniors who spoke at the event on, on Tuesday said, and it was kind of a, a, kind of a light bulb moment for me when she said this, she said, you know, I have work friends now. And I just thought that was really, really cool. And her work friends are a load of nurses at MUSC. And, you know, these are the people, I guess, that she hangs out with now. Now that she's 18 years old and, you know, on the cusp of earning significantly more money than I do. Uh, and that's just really, really cool. We just love that for them. Um, so that's a little bit about the trajectory of work experience. Uh, again, um, our middle school teachers mentioned about the college research. We really put a rocket under that when we get into, um, when we get into high school. And so they do SAT prep, ACT prep in 10th grade. They do that in 11th grade. Uh, their character ed program in 11th grade is college research. Uh, so they do that with the counselor. Then they finish that and we've got it lined up. So then in my business class, uh, we then do a, a whole project um, about um, the cost effectiveness of a college investment. So we look at the payback period. We look at what your student loan is going to be once you factor in inflation. We look at the time value of money. We look at missed earnings for four years if you go to college. And we look at all that kind of stuff. So the stuff that they've done with, uh, with Jenny in eighth grade, we really put a rocket under that. So that you can see how that college stuff goes all the way through. You can see how that work experience and internship skills for the workplace goes all the way through school. Um, character ed, fifth grade, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. That goes all the way through. So we've done a huge amount in the last uh, in the last few years of just aligning the curriculum uh, to make sure that that trajectory takes them all the way through. Uh, so that's just a little bit about about high school. And again, I would a absolutely encourage you guys to watch the the high school video. Um, you'd be pleased to know that we're about to round off. Uh, there's a, a there's an army of people here with if you have any questions. So. Um, you know, Miss Barhite looks after 5th and 6th grade, I look after 7th and 8th grade. Uh, we have an incredible teaching team at middle school. We've got Liz, our Dean of Students, we've got our counselor. If you've got any questions about any of those specific programmes, uh, Mrs. Berry Maggie is here as well. She's, uh, she's in charge of admissions, if you've got any admissions questions. And then we kind of put this in at the end because um, we know that sometimes parents are like, you know, I'd like to know a little bit more about the rigors of PBL. And so we just included some research. So for anyone that wants to just read a little bit more about what the independent research uh, says on, on project-based learning, then we'd absolutely encourage you to check out some of these links, some of these uh, resources. Uh, if you haven't seen the 2015 documentary, uh, Most Likely to Succeed, I absolutely encourage you to watch it. I encourage you to have your kids watch it with you as well. Um, it will just change everything that you think about uh, when you think about education and, and what's beneficial for young people. Um, Liz made the comment uh, earlier on that you know when you get into the world of work, it's very unlikely that someone is going to say to you, okay, now you're on your own, you can't use any research or anybody else's expertise, go into this room over here and solve this pro problem alone in the next hour, which is test-taking. Uh, and I'm not saying that there's not a place in the educational landscape for test-taking, uh, there absolutely is. 
Um, but does it lead to deep, meaningful retention of, of an acquisition of skills and, and knowledge? We, we don't believe that it does. Um, and so that's really important for us. Um, final thing I want to talk about just very, very quickly in terms of that continued trajectory. We talked about financial literacy in eighth grade. They have uh, some financial literacy in the other parts of middle school. Uh, this year, seventh grade did a junior achievement unit. Uh, and then it's weaved into some other things in, in fifth and sixth grade. So they have junior achievement in seventh financial literacy in eighth, and then they get an, uh, an enterprise class, a business class, business planning class uh, when they get into high school. So that financial literacy, like the other pillars, goes all the way through. Um, and I think that that is the end. So thank you very, very much for coming today. Thank you for giving up your time. Uh, we know that parents are very, very busy. It's not easy to get here at 8.15 in the morning. Uh, we are going to conclude if anybody's got any questions. We would love to take any questions that you have about the program or the way that school's going to be set up. Um, any other plans that we have for COVID, we're happy to take anything that you guys might have.